Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Today we're heading to a galaxy far, far away, which is a very unsubtle way of saying we are talking about Star Wars. So our special guest is Dr. Chris Kempshaw. So Chris is an academic and historian specialising in the First World War and popular representations of history in modern media. His works include books on the First World War and computer games and British, French and American relations on the Western Front. But today he's talking to us about his new book, The History and Politics of Star Wars, Death Stars and Democracy. And with me today, I have the pleasure of being joined by two super Star Wars fans, Chris and Sam. Hello. Hello there. Ah, General Kenobi. We're very excited for this one. And um, so if we launch straight into it, Chris, so your book is the first to examine Star Wars links with history and politics through not just the motion pictures, but the expanded universe of novels and games too. Now, you talk about this a little bit in the book, but how did you even initially go about selecting from this huge amount of material? So I'll give you like the the, the professional answer that make first that makes me sound like, you know, a, a smart, dedicated, focused researcher. Um, and then I'll do the not inconsiderable real reason shortly afterwards. So the, 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 like the, the official reason is that when people tend to do studies about Star Wars and they look at Star Wars, they kind of under, very, very understandably begin and end with the films because, it, you know, it, it's pretty easy to watch a film. You just put the film on and there you go and you watch it and it takes care of itself and the narrative and it lasts for an X, number of t- uh, you know, an X amount of time. And, you know, there were three films and then there were six and then there were nine and now there's 11. Um, but again, you know, it's a it's a cinematic work that you can kind of very easily get involved in. Um, and that's kind of tended to be the staple for examining Star Wars uh, for, you know, on any kind of scope of media or, or history or anything like that. But the issue with doing that is that it's not the entirety of Star Wars. You know, certainly since the the 1990s, you know, you have something that's kind of now referred to as Legends, but back then was called the Expanded Universe, which takes in, you know, hundreds of books, hundreds of graphic novels, loads of computer games. There is a huge wealth of additional material, all of which is Star Wars, all of which is kind of controlled by Lucasfilm to ensure that it matches up with continuity. And the example for this that I often use is, you know, it's it's to make sure that, you know, if you... I don't know, write about Luke Skywalker in one book, you know, he's using the same lightsaber as in a different book. Or, you know, if you draw Han, you know, Han Solo, who looks like Harrison Ford, you don't then in the next book draw draw him so he looks like Danny DeVito. Um, It's to to maintain, you know, some kind of continuity control. But it's not realistic to ask someone to go, okay, you want to do Star Wars, but what I really need to do is go and read several hundred novels and graphic novels and play a bunch of computer games before you can come back and and do anything. So it's just no one no one is going to choose to do that unless and this is where we come to the less than professional answer. You've already wasted quite a lot of your life doing that, um, and you already have all of those materials, and you already have read them and played them and collected them and understand them. At which point you can just transfer it into this new sphere, um, which is what. I did. So my my starting point was basically anything that has a Star Wars badge on it is eligible for consideration in this study because it all fits into the wider continuity, all orbits around the same rules of Star Wars, you know, Jedi are the good guys, Empire are the bad guys, all of the kind of the major touchstones of Star Wars, which actually meant it was the easiest research process of my life. Because ordinarily with First World War stuff, it's like, oh, God, I need to go to London, I need to go to the British Library, I need to order something from the Imperial War Museum, that's going to take the rest of my life for it to be to arrive. Um, I've got to do all of this stuff. Whereas with this, it's like, oh, I need to think, well, I just 
guess I'll walk upstairs and get it off of the bookshelf then. Because, you know, I already, I already had all of this stuff, so it was super, super easy. Um, so that was the kind of the thought process behind it, that actually what, certainly that this study needed, but actually what the, 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 the field of Star Wars studies needed was someone to do the lot, or to, to at least give an overview of the lot, so that whoever comes next can then make use of it. You know, they don't necessarily have to go and read all of the books, but if they want to do something in the expanded universe, there is like a baseline foundational understanding transmitted through my book that might make it easier to know where to go. So History Hack is, is, a, is a history podcast. So some listeners might be thinking, why have they got someone to talk about sci-fi? That, that thing's a... not going to wear off. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a lot of a lot of uh, historical analysis in your book isn't there so it was written um a lot of it was done around the time of the vietnam war can you explain how how this influenced george lucas yeah so the vietnam region? war is is basically like the formative moment of george lucas's kind of life and 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 view of the world um he spends a lot of his early life absolutely terrified that he's going to get called up into the army to fight um i think the fact that he gets into university probably um is the thing that keeps him it keeps him out of out of contention for the draft um but he kind of ends up viewing the vietnam war very much in a kind of a very particular which i'll kind of come to in a minute kind of lens of of right and wrong um and or kind of good and evil and in the lead up to working on star wars he's working on apocalypse now uh which is stuck in kind of development hell um as a as a vietnam film and he doesn't look like it's going anywhere. So he starts thinking about, you know, in literal terms, how could I set a Vietnam War film in space? Um, and in the earliest drafts of Star Wars, he is very explicit. You know, he, he talks about the, the balance of the galaxy, talks about good and evil, and he couches all of it in Vietnam terms. Um, and what A New Hope, which is the original Star Wars, is supposed to be, but it's not, it's not understood as such by the audience. It's, it's an anti-American Vietnam film. The Galactic Empire are the United States of America. They are a, a fascistic power that con contains kind of huge technological advantages. They've created weapons that can destroy entire planets. He is envisaging the Galactic Empire as America five or so years after the collapse of democracy, which means that the Rebel Alliance, uh, an organized guerrilla warfare group fighting in jungles out of temples, are the Viet Cong. Um, and in any number of interviews, George Lucas, you know, explains the the the, the galactic civil war and the, and the role of the rebels and the empire within those kind of those kind of terms. He views it as an asynchronous battle. He absolutely explicitly names the rebel alliance as being um, the Viet Cong, and clearly that the the galactic empire is um, is the United States of America that has descended into fascism. There are issues with this in the. And again, like some of these are understandable issues. You know, George Lucas isn't a historian. He's not under any obligation to create a work of history. What he's doing is he's creating a version of history based on his kind of pop oh, understanding, his popular understanding of history as it's transmitted to him through films and TV shows and, and the like as well. So to, to criticise George Lucas for not producing an accurate piece of history is to kind of miss the point because he's not pretending to be a historian. At the same time, he says, shortly before criticising George Lucas for not producing an accurate piece of history, um, when he talks about the Rebel Alliance as the Viet Cong, um, the, the Rebel Alliance doesn't appear to have like a, certainly in, in A New Hope, it's not clear what it is that they're trying to do except for overthrowing the Empire. You know, Empire bad, don't want Empire, therefore we're good. But there's no wider ideology behind that. There's no kind of clear political manifesto or anything along those lines, which makes the, the comparison to the Viet Cong quite difficult because, you know, you can say quite a lot about the North Vietnamese, but they're super clear on what it is that they're trying to do. You know, they definitely have a political ideology and a manifesto and a very clear political idea of what it is that they want to create once they have defeated South Vietnam and um, the United States of America. So George Lucas one kind of constructing this historical and political infrastructure around Star Wars doesn't necessarily have a super clear understanding of the actual historical and political sources that he's that he's drawing on. And that's a, a weird, interesting thing that's kind of an ongoing trend at times within within his conception of the world in Star Wars. Mainly in my own head canon, but I always sort of put, put the rebellion as sort of very similar to the 1776 rebellion against the British, which is quite helpful because the Empire all played by Englishmen. So Lucas <laughs> does also chime in on that he, he'll he'll use the, the the american war of independence as an example of 
a technologically inferior asymmetric warfare against the evil empire. So he'll he'll draw on, on that as well. Like in Empire Strikes Back, Jensen was played by an Englishman, Wedges Garner, but they dubbed him over with an American voice actor, which kind of adds to the continuity of Americans on one side and British on the other. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, um, you mentioned it already, but the the with the Empire, the glorious Galactic Empire, there are other symbols of fascism, um, which uh, Lucas draws on a lot of fascist imagery. But how is that? How does that come out in the books and the films? So George Lucas, again, similar to what it is we were just talking about, has a has a really interesting view of fascism. And it can basically be summed up in that, in his mind, a fascist is something that you are rather than fascism is something that you do. So if you're a bad guy, you're a fascist because you're a bad guy, rather than, you know, fascism being an ideology of, of itself that, you know, leads people to do certain actions. You know, fascists do things that are fascistic. It's, it's a kind of a self-perpetuating thing. But what you get in Star Wars is the idea that because you're a bad guy, therefore you're a fascist, so fascists are bad guys. Which, you know, is not unusual in the world of, of cinema, certainly not in the 1970s and the 80s and even up, even up to today. But what it means is, and Chris is going to like this, is that at times it's not entirely clear. I mean, they do a lot of bad stuff. You know, blowing up planets isn't nice and, you know, choking people to death isn't, isn't a good thing. But the Empire is bad because they're bad. But it's never actually explained you know, what makes the Empire imperial. For example, you know, do they have colonies? Do they have expanding borders? Do they have any of the things that we would look at as a historical empire and go, these are the things that make you imperial? In the same way as like, okay, what are the things that make you fascistic as, as a galactic empire? Um, but what then makes it kind of interesting in extension of that is the weird role or the duality between Darth Vader, who is seen as, you know, the primary protagonist of at least the first two Star Wars films, and then Propalpity. Because loads of the cast, loads of people, like reviewers and fans, like talk, because Darth Vader is, you know, the big bad guy in A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, talk about him in terms of being Adolf Hitler. But it's a really bad comparison because they share virtually, like they share literally no similarities at all. You know, Darth Vader is not a charismatic man. He isn't giving speeches that motivate people. He doesn't appear to have any actual ideology of his own apart from I want to rule the galaxy. Um, there's nothing particularly Hitlerish, Hitlerish about him, and also he works for another guy. Um, it's not like you know Hitler had a boss and he was just a hired help. Um, Palpatine makes a far more convincing Hitler in that aspect, um, and certainly when you go back to the prequel trilogies with the kind of the collapse of democracy and and Palpatine's rise to power, you know George Lucas is explicitly drawing on figures like. Um, Hitler, like Napoleon, sorry Sam, like um, Julius Caesar, um, and the like, as you know, clear examples of men who are dictators and are given and seize dem democratic power. But you end up with that kind of weird tension between who is actually the bad guy and what are they supposed to represent in that original trilogy? Because Darth Vader just doesn't work as a Hitler comparison. Um, what you then get in the in the sequel trilogy is a far more overt, super kind of delineated Nazi-esque imagery. I mean, it's, you know, the front cover of the book was was picked because it's basically Nuremberg in space. It's the the, the Force Awakens big speech on um, Starkiller base scene when you've got, you know, big red and black flags of the of the regime. Stormtroopers make, you know, single arm salutes. There's a guy raving on a stage about destroying democracy and, and, and stuff. Disney have decided to go down a far more kind of overtly Nazi route with elements of the Galactic Empire since they've taken over, but definitely with the First Order, which, again, makes it makes it interesting, but kind of leads it away a little bit from that, actually, this is supposed to be America, it's a cautionary tale, but into something that's more kind of historically framed in that sense. And if we move now to some contemporary references, so there are some moments in the book where you note some unfortunate timing, to say the least, in terms of some Star Wars products which came out and appeared to predict particular events. Could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's some there's some super weird stuff that happens, particularly in the novels of Star Wars, and it's there's a slight kind of Tom Clancy aspect to it. For those of any of your listeners who've read the book Debt of Honor, which people say predicted the 9/11 attacks because there's a moment where a pilot crashes a plane into the the U.S. Capitol building. Um, 
in that um, towards the end of the 1990s, um, all of the books and the novels that they've been working on have been extending this war between the Rebel Alliance slash New Republic, which is the democracy that they become, and what's left of the Galactic Empire. But eventually, there's only so many times you can do... <gasps> The Empire's here. Oh, no, we've got to tell. Oh, don't wait. No, we bait them again. But I'm sure they'll be back next week before eventually it runs out of legs. So the um, Lucasfilm decided to create a brand new series called the New Jedi Order series of books. And they created a brand new enemy for them. And it's an alien race called the Yahoos and Vong, who are based nominally on Aztec and Inca society. Um, they are a group of aliens invading from outside the galaxy, but they um, are hyper kind of religiously fanatic, worship multiple gods, um, believe in kind of ritual sacrifice with kind of overt exclamations of piety and, and worship to their gods, believe all forms of modern kind of space technology are an abomination um, and believe, you know, there's a particular time period when a particular approach to to, to, to the world that, you know, all sorts of kind of various species and races and religions and technology are not um, are not suitable for. So they they basically invade the galaxy and wage a war of kind of religious genocide um, against the 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 already inhabitants. And one of the peaks of this kind of moment of this narrative arc is a book called Star by Star, which sees um, the world of Coruscant, which is like the galactic capital, is conquered by the Hughes and Vol uh, fleet, and they do this by um, you know, they bring their own enormous big fleet out of, out of hyperspace, but they ahead of them, they drive all of these civilian ships, which have got, you know, ordinary people on them. And they use those to crash into the planetary shields and bring the shields down. And then they use them to crash into the planet's surface to destroy various buildings and the like, um, which obviously, you know, this is all written quite a long way in advance before, before Star by Star comes out. But what you've got, therefore, is a group of religious fanatic aliens who believe in you know a very particular thought view of life a very particular kind of approach to modern technology and the like with sacrifices and uh, they're kind of like a weird death cult um who conquer the galactic capital or by crashing civilian ships into shields and buildings and that book came out in october 2001 which is extremely unfortunate timing um for lucasfilm you know mere weeks after 9 11 and suddenly every aspect of that whole narrative arc is changed because you know there are a more than a few elements of all of that which seem to correspond with an emerging view of uh radical islam and al-qaeda of kind of overt religious terrorism um you know uh, very strong feelings about um, various forms of kind of modern democracy and technology and the like, and a willingness to, to kill and kill others and crushing things into civilian infrastructure, which causes a lot of problems for Lucasfilm in the immediate aftermath. Um, they hugely regret the timing of the book coming out and they have to start, I think, changing to greater and lesser, lesser extent some of the elements of the Hughes and Fong to try and rebalance this because the whole plot of their new series is now completely changed through no through, through no fault of their own but yeah it's real bad it's real bad and unfortunate timing for them and i think yeah i, I don't know what that that book series would have ended up looking like but i think it, it changes quite significantly in their in their planning process as it goes through so it sounds like that there is a, a huge extended universe, and I must admit, uh, I haven't actually read uh, a lot of Star Wars literature. I am, I am more of a mainstream fan, and I'm probably putting myself out to be crucified for that. So um, while these extended universe authors were trying to write books that were were about the the era that the the prequel trilogy were in, but they couldn't because the canon hadn't been done yet because Lucas was making the prequel trilogy but not releasing the plot details. What effect did that have on the on the novels and games that we have? So what ends up happening is Lucas bars off, kind of just blacks off on huge chunks of the Star Wars timeline, says you cannot write anything before A New Hope. Um because I'm intending to go back and I'm gonna do the Clone Wars and I'm gonna do the fall of Anakin Skywalker and I'm gonna do all of this stuff. And I don't want you meddling and making stuff annoying for me. It's, it, you know, this is my toy. And you can't play with it. Um, so what that means is you get a few bits and pieces that come out during the time period of the original trilogy. You know, you get books like Shadows of the Empire and various computer games that come out during that time period. 
But the vast majority of the expanded universe novels come post Return of the Jedi. So they have to go forwards because they can't, they're not allowed to go backwards. Um, so they begin writing again with kind of the beginning of the expanded universe in kind of 1990, 1991, um, by moving forward in a post Return of the Jedi time period, which is actually mirroring elements of the post Cold War period because you have also you know in the lead up to it you've had you know two big superpowers you've had uh the united states and you've had uh the soviet union and the soviet union's collapsed and now you've only got one left which mapped onto the star wars world is you had the rebel alliance and you had the galactic empire and now you've got the new republic and the galactic empire is effectively gone so you get these kind of emerging post-cold war post-soviet investigations within star wars that map onto a lot of what's happening in american culture um, the phrase I use in, in the book is that Star Wars ends up being a cultural weather vane because it shows you the way the wind is blowing in kind of American culture and American thought process. And what is interesting is that by about the mid 1990s um, in Hollywood, you're getting films like, um, say, Crimson Tide or um, Air Force One or, you know, various, again, Tom Clancy novels are being made into films that all operate around this idea of, Soviet Union's gone. But oh no, there are scary Soviet ultra-nationalist Russians who've taken over a tiny part of Asia, but it turns out they've got nuclear warheads, and oh god, they're going to nuke everybody, and it's terrifying, and how do we deal with these people? Because it's not a country, but it's super scary, and we don't know what to do. And then, you know, Harrison Ford's the president of the United States, and it's fine. Um, but you get books exactly like that, in the Star Wars universe as well, it's kind of, oh no, this Imperial Admiral has kind of arrived and they've taken control of some of the fleet and they've got a big scary weapon and what are we going to do about it? Because it's scary and it's not like they're an entire country or a state, but they've got this weapon and it, oh, I don't know what to do. And then it turns out, you know, Harrison Ford's hand solo and it all works out fine. But you get this kind of expression of, of anxiety about the, the vacuum of the Soviet Union through the vacuum of the Galactic Empire. But you also get moments that tie up with um, other kind of geopolitical moments, you know, you get the Rwandan genocide in the mid-1990s, you get a Srebrenica genocide in the mid-1990s, both of which are pretty clearly explored within novels of the Star Wars universe of, you know, here is, you know, there's been a galactic genocide, um, the New Republic and the Jedi basically stand by and watch it happen because they don't want to get involved because they don't get involved in another war. And, you know, does that actually, is this a good thing? Is make us kind of kind of bad guys if we just watch a bunch of people get killed and not do anything about it just because we don't want to get involved? And, you know, that's a critique of the United Nations and the United States of America at exactly the same time that, you know, the public is becoming aware of Srebrenica and becoming aware of Rwanda. Um, Star Wars novelists are exploring those exact moments within the pages of their books, but they're doing it quicker than Hollywood can because publishing works quicker than making a film does. Um, so actually, it looks like they're ahead of the curve when, you know, to varying extent, they're probably approaching these things at almost exactly the same moment, which makes it super interesting, but also super weird. So 2012 comes along, Disney by Lucasfilm, all the old canon, all the good, all, all, all the old ex extended universe, um, ceases to exist as such yeah and um, becomes legends how does and D disney have now taken over the canon they're rewriting everything so how are they using historical influences and are they still very present so i mean to touch on the the, the expanded universe being being decanonized i know it's the type of thing that that makes some people very very angry um and i'm i'm not one of those people um because from a pure kind of business standpoint of what disney wanted to do god the expanded universe was a big cluttered thing um and you know this is coming from someone who really really liked it but you'd end up with those you know sometimes when bernard cornwall decides he wants to do another shark book and he therefore has to like identify like a 15 minute period on a tuesday when he hasn't written about something that shark was doing just so he can set a book in it it would have been disney would have been trying to do that with the expanded universe you know desperately trying to find a random weekend when Han Solo, Luke and Leia weren't doing something and then set an entire film trilogy in it. Just, there was no room left for them to have any kind of narrative possibility. So they decanonize everything. But it's not like they burned my books. They're still upstairs on a bookshelf. Um, and they, by decanonizing everything, it gives them the chance to have a, like, a, like a cultural reset. And the standpoint for, particularly for the First Order in The Force Awakens is, J.J. Abrams says, their thought process was, what if, all of the leading Nazis had escaped to Argentina and decided to get back together again. And what would that look like 
20 or 30 years afterwards. So it's very much a kind of, a, and the First World War, very much a neo-Nazi movement reinterpreted in, you know, space pew pew land um, to, be a, to be a kind of a historical, historical touching point. And from that point, they've kind of worked outwards in kind of repopulating the galaxy. So the First Order are very Nazi focused and the Galactic Empire has become very Nazi focused. But there are also kind of ongoing touchstone kind of either historical and contemporary critiques in that. So the New Republic in the period between um, Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens basically becomes Britain, France and America during the 1920s and 1930s. It, theirs is a story of appeasement. They recognise that there were neo-Nazis living next door, but they don't want to disrupt anything. They don't want to get into another war. So maybe if we just kind of give them a bit of what they want, they'll be fine. Because as everybody knows, fascists are easily sated. Um, and it's very easy to, you know, just buy them off and they never cause any problem once you've given them um, something that they want. Um, and that becomes a kind of like a rolling aspect within the within the post uh, Return of the Jedi kind of era. This idea that actually it's it's a story about apathy that leads the New Republic to be destroyed because they're just not willing to stand up to the, the emerging uh, threat on their borders. But if you take things like Andor, like new TV show, super great, absolutely loved it. Furious that it came out after the book. Um, so I couldn't include it in in any of the chapters, but that would have added quite a lot of words to what was already quite a long book. Um, but the um, Tony Gilroy has been talking in at length in loads and loads of interviews about his historical ideas behind it. You know, personally, very explicit. This is a this is a story that is drawing on very recent President Trump is leading America aspects. You know, we want to talk about what happens when, you know, like the banality of of evil. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, to, to, to kind of draw in that idea, the idea that, you know, it's just awful people doing really benign things that are awful. Um, but also, you know, things like the, 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 the big, there's a big funeral scene at the end of, at the end of the season. So, oh yeah, I was, um, I was drawing on, uh, images of, of funeral parades in like Northern Ireland, uh, during the Troubles for that. So Star Wars will co just constantly keep dipping into stuff that they can, that they can draw on. Um, and it's interesting to see how they're doing that with, with a slightly blanker canvas and they're kind of doing it in real time. Um, but also, you know, I'm older, so I'm able to recognise it more. So I don't know if it's more overt or just like, you know, because I didn't watch like A New Hope as like a five-year-old or a seven-year-old and at the end of it go, right. And then walk into the next room and go, mother, father, the Vietnam War seems to be very concerning and we should probably do something about this. Because I was a five or seven-year-old, it didn't mean it. it. Again, it was Space Pew Pew Land. I was one of the audience who didn't get it was a Vietnam film. Um, so I don't, yeah, it's hard to say whether or not they're being more overt or if I'm just like not as, not as stupid as I, as I used to be. <laughs> and actually with you saying that about Vietnam, is there a, a passage somewhere in your book, if I remember, where um, George Lucas was, or, or someone else was kind of like thinking, well, if the audience can't see these links, it's their fault and, and not kind of the way we're actually portraying it. Yeah, there were a couple of those. George Lucas does get quite upset at times when people don't get that it's a Vietnam War film. Like, but I did all the things and the audience didn't get it. Why don't they understand? Um, they just got distracted by the space lasers and stuff. And they're cool. But I, wait, I, I don't understand why people didn't get it. Um, but there's also an author called uh, Kevin J. Anderson. Um, he wrote various Star Wars uh, novels. And one of the ones um, I reference in the book is a book called Dark Saber which involves um, the, the Hutt cartel, who are like, you know, in, you know, galactic gangsters, who are also slugmen, um, get control of like Death Star technology and they use it to make their own mini Death Star laser and they're going to use it to extort a bunch of money. And in an interview, the author, Kevin J. Anderson, again, gets similarly upset because he, people don't understand what he's talking about. He's like, people, people read it and they were just like, oh, it's, a, it's another Death Star. It's super weapon of the week. He's like, no, 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 no. This is, I'm talking about Russia. I'm talking about nuclear proliferation, about what happens when you have all of these, these super weapons and they move out of government control and they move into the hands of criminal gangs and the like and what that might, might mean. And I thought I was being super clear and the audience didn't get it. They just thought it's another, it's another space laser. Um, so there is like an ongoing aspect of, you know, Star Wars authors and creators are quite clear at times about what they want the audience to get out of it. But the thing about that is always is you can't, you can't, legislate for what the audience are going to get out of it. I was just going to say, the main reason no one really noticed that in Darksaber is because 
the hut part was just a subplot because Admiral Dala comes back, gets the Empire back together and goes off on a killing spree. And that's the best part of the book. Yeah, it gets the whole gang back together. Says the, the Dark Saber Super Fat. It's my favourite book. Sorry. <laughs> I, love that. I actually went um, earlier. You were talking about um, how you hadn't read many of the books. I mean, I must confess to listeners that um, my engagement has, has only been limited to a couple of Star Wars films. So the fans may, may come at me for that. But I did love Chris's book, though, Chris Kempshaw's book. So, yes, very much enjoying the chat. So I we should put that on a poster. I've only watched a few Star Wars films, but I did enjoy <laughs> the book. Yes, we should, shouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it's encouraged me. I should go back and, and watch the ones that I haven't seen, to be fair. Um, yeah, cause it, it, you know, combining history and, and fantasy are the things I enjoy. So, yeah. So as well as talking about how things have kind of changed since Disney took over and kind of, you know, fluctuating characters and events and things, um, if we move generally into the um, the differing representations of two particular groups I'm thinking, the Jedis and the Siths, is there a little bit you can you can talk to us about um, about kind of changing representations of morality in the Star Wars universe? Yeah, so it, it, the Jedi in particular are are a very weird group, and the way they're kind of portrayed has shifted repeatedly over films and books and computer games and novels. Um, in theory, and if we take the kind of portrayal from um, the original trilogy, they are kind of, you know, a, a sort of warrior monk um, who was part of this kind of previous order that has since been exterminated. Um, you know, there's lots of uh, kind of Buddhist and, and almost kind of frankly Orientalist kind of ideas about philosophy and, and kind of Zen and the like that's kind of woven into them. Um, George Lucas conceives of them as kind of being sort of peace officers or kind of peace corps folk who um, they're not like they're not police officers. They're not going to you know walk up to you and slap on the cuffs or anything like that. And they're not going to necessarily bust into a building and, you know, ice a bunch of dudes um, to, 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 you know, end a drug ring or something like that. They, they exist to kind of go out. And if you're doing something wrong, suggest, yeah, you sure you want to do that? Maybe, maybe, maybe don't do a bad thing. That, that would be cool, too. Um, and if you've been doing something super wrong, you know, to bring you back to the to the Senate. And that's normally what we're supposed to see of them in um, the prequel trilogy. Um, the problem with this, and it's worth noting, you know, that the, the Phantom Menace as the first prequel film kind of begins at a point just as the Clone Wars is, you know, it's on the horizon, you know, the collapse and the, the eroding of the of the morality of the Jedi is is imminent, undertaken by, by Emperor Palpatine and his kind of nefarious schemes. But it is possible to say that even at this point, the Jedi suck. They are not good people. Um, it's not a good organisation to be a part of. Um, because even before, you know, Palpatine's just a random senator in Naboo. He's not in charge of anything. He's not, like, particularly well-known or anything. And, you know, obviously he later comes to power. But Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, rock up on Tatooine with Princess Amidala and they find Anakin Skywalker. And he's a slave and his mum's a slave. And Anakin's like, have you come to save us? And Qui-Gon Jinn's like, yeah, you know, Tatooine's not part of the Galactic Republic. And I'm not here to save slaves. So I guess we'll just, I don't know, leave, I suppose, because, you know, that's a that's a good thing to do if you're this morally pure thing. Um, but we'll, we'll buy you if we can. I could do something about your mum. I'm not here to save slaves. I guess I'll just go home. Then. It's like, wow, you people are garbage. Um, it's like, OK, you know, there's a difference between ending the entire institution of slavery, which, you know, might be beyond, you know, two guys with laser swords and doing like literally the bare minimum to improve somebody's life. Um, and what you end up with with the Jedi is th they exist, again, almost as a critique of the United Nations in that their morality stops at the water's edge. If they don't have a mandate to do a thing, they're not going to do it. Um, they are just going to stand by and watch because they haven't been explicitly told by the state through which effectively governs them and gives them their orders to do something. They will just stand back and not get involved, um, which is, a you know, not necessarily the best approach if you're like the super moral people of the universe. Um, because, you know, what's what happens in the moments when the force tells you to do one thing and the government tells you to do something else? And it appears that the Jedi will do what the government tells them to do. 
um, which is, you know, a, a very particular kind of state apparatus for them. Um, and then you get the Clone Wars and the Jedi get kind of turned into generals. You know, the, the thing that they're not supposed to be, they're not supposed to be soldiers, they're not supposed to be fighting wars, they're not supposed to be, you know, doing military actions. It's, it's designed to erode their morality and their vision uh, and their kind of publicity image in, in the Republic to make them basically the bad guys of the war by by Palpatine. Um, and, you know, make it make it easier for them to be exterminated further down the line. But what's interesting is that even through like the 1990s and even into the, the 2000s, again, the, you know, the prequel trilogy films, certainly Attack of the Clones and definitely Revenge of the Sith are coming out in a post 9-11 world where, you know, the interaction with state power and warfare and terrorism and, you know, what is an acceptable thing to do in service of the greater good have dramatically changed. Um, you get things like in, in like ye olde computer games. Um, if you take kind of any number of like Jedi Knight computer games, is that once upon a time, if you wanted to shoot lightning from your hands, and I would quite like to be able to shoot lightning from my hands, but you can only do it if you're a bad guy, if you're a Sith. It's a Sith power. It's a dark side power. Um, you know, the Emperor does it in Return of the Jedi because he's a bad guy. Dooku does it in Attack of the Clones because he's a bad guy. Nobody else can do it because it's a it's a aggressive power. You're not supposed to use it. It's a, it's a dark side power. Is that during this time period? Those rules change in some of the novels and in some of the computer games where actually if you're shooting lightning out of your hands for a good reason, then it's fine. Is it? It does you know, ritually barbecuing somebody, but doing it for the right reasons is is it becomes a fine thing to do. Um but it's happening at the same time that, you know, we say that torture's bad, but what about waterboarding a guy because we need to know a thing? And it's this kind of it's this post nine eleven arc of um you know what was what's the phrase um you'd extreme interrogation or, or something along those lines um that this is playing out about you know what is an acceptable thing to do with the force and there's episodes of the, the animated series the clone wars where the jedi just basically waterboard a guy because mm. they need some information so why wouldn't we torture him it's like, because it's not a it's not a good thing to do uh good people don't don't do these things and this is kind of why i think you guys might suck um, and you know the, the Sith aren't good people either. They're very, very clearly bad guys. But they make critiques about the hypocrisy of the Jedi. Um, there's a quote in in a Clone Wars affiliated book where Dooku critiques Yoda in particular in the Jedi Order, saying they can't do anything for slaves, but they can do something for slave owners, and this gives us a gap to exploit. Um, the idea that the Jedi exists as a, as a apparatus of the state, and they're therefore no better or worse than the state in which they serve, and in many ways are worse because they will ditch their morality simply because somebody in power told them to. So I want to talk more about Palpatine because I'm sure it will surprise nobody who's ever listened to me on any podcast in history. I'm a Bonapartist. In another franchise, I am a Slytherin. In Star Wars, I am wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, unrelentingly a Sith. Give me lightning hands. Give me a red lightsaber. The only time I will tolerate a Jedi is if he listened to the Christmas Down the Pub episode is Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> so, well, that went real well for him. <laughs> the Christmas episode also didn't end well for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you mentioned earlier, at the at the beginning of the of the the prequels, Palpatine he doesn't really feature that much. He doesn't seem overly important, but obviously the the Empire is looming large from from the start. Can you discuss for me the portrayals of Palpatine and the functioning of the Empire itself? So, firstly, it's important to note Ian McDermott is just brilliant as. Emperor Palpatine, 100% um, favourite actor, 100% favourite character. Also, for those listeners who who want a kind of another thing to check out, he also plays um, uh, a significant part in the First World War uh, BBC drama 37 Days, um, where he plays um, the foreign minister whose name has literally vanished out of my head since I started this sentence. Maybe if I keep talking, it'll come back to me. Um... He's also in the, all the king's men as the as the priest who goes out to look for David Jason's he squad is. at Gallipoli. So you know, pick any moment in history. Ian McDermott is up there, and he's making things worse. Um, so you know, he might actually be a, th a Sith Lord. I was just saying, he he doesn't end well in Dragon Slayer. I mean, he doesn't end well in 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 any of the Star Wars films either. Ah, he plays Edward Gray in Thirty Seven Days. I was going to say um, Edward Gray. 
Ah, there we go. We'll edit, <laughs> edit my bit out and drop your bit in. You're right, he was Edward Grey in, in 37 Days. So if we take Palpatine as a character, very, very little is known about him for a very, very long time. Um, you know, he isn't named in Return of the Jedi. Um, we get no backstory for him. We just know he's the Emperor, and it turns out he can use the dark side of the Force because lightning hands. Um, he is only, he's first named in the novelization of A New Hope. Um, but because of the lock that George Lucas puts on things, we don't get any backstory for him. Very, very little is known about the Emperor before the prequel uh, trilogy comes out. Um, to the extent that, you know, a lot of people who aren't mega Star Wars nerds don't know that Palpatine, played by Ian McDermott, is the same character as the Emperor, played by Ian McDermott in Return of the Jedi. Um, it's actually, you know, a, a fairly effective twist in Revenge of the Sith that, you know, various people who I've shown the, the prequel films to for the first time don't see coming. They don't realise that, you know, the person who's making every benefit out of everything that's happening is Palpatine. And what you end up with is, you know, the historical aspects drawn apart from him in, as I said earlier, you know, you get Pits of Napoleon, sorry, uh, Hitler, you get Julius Caesar, as this vision of democracies aren't seized, they're given away to the guy who appears to be the best place to deal with the unfolding crisis. You know, it's the Reichstag fire. It's, um, you know, any number of kind of issues around the fall of the Roman Republic. It's um, concerns about counter-revolution in revolutionary France. Um, and we give the power to this guy. He can 100% be trusted to use it reasonably, and he'll definitely give it back um, when the time comes. Um, but beyond that, even in like the expanded universe novels that are coming out around it, it's very hard to get in, you know, details about what is Palpatine actually like? Who is he as a, as a guy? You get like the public persona of mild-mannered senator who comes to power, is dealing with an unfolding crisis, doesn't want to get distracted from it, stays long beyond the end of his term, all of those bits and pieces. Um, to the extent that you almost end up with two characters, you get Palpatine and you get Darth Sidious. And everybody takes Darth Sidious to be the real version of Palpatine. And I'm not convinced um, that it is. I think it's just an aspect of Palpatine the man. Um, and there's a book that comes out called um, Alphabet Squadron by Alexander Freed. It's uh, There's a whole trilogy of books. And when they came out, I thought, oh, these are going to be like the X-Wing novels that have come out in like the 1990s. It's going to be like Top Gun in space. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be fantastic. They are, the Alphabet Squadron is an amazing trilogy of books. They are not like Top Gun in space. They are not like the X-Wing novels. They are a bleak, grim, depressing view of the impact of war on the people who are fighting it. But you get a critique of Palpatine in one of those books that is pretty perfect of he's a petty, jealous, arrogant, thin-skinned man who can't possibly conceive of a world without him, and he does awful things because he's garbage. And, yeah, pretty good, I think. And, you know, that could easily be written about Hitler. You could easily write it about Stalin. You could easily write it about Nepal, uh, Julius Sousa. Um, just to ensure that I don't get kicked off the podcast. Um, of this vision of a, of a guy who is so arrogant and desperate to rule, but also desperate for people to love him, you know, to accept that they are being oppressed and be grateful for it. You know, how dare you reject me how dare you rebel don't you know what i am don't you know what i've done for you um that image of palpatine i find super interesting this just awful awful garbage person who happens to have unbelievable power but will always want a little bit more of it and is you know the the critique again of that luke skywalker gives him in return of jedi your overconfidence is your weakness it just emerges again and again about the Emperor. He just cannot envisage, with all of his psychic powers, the fact that people hate him and will do whatever they, needs to be done to get rid of him. He just can't accept it on like a fundamental level. Just want to say, make the galaxy great again. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's more than a little Donald Trump in, in the modern version of Palpatine, I think. Mm, just a little bit. But um, it wouldn't be a sci-fi movie if we didn't talk about aliens. 
and you discuss concepts of otherness and representation in Star Wars. The aliens and droids, are, because the, obviously the main heroes are all humans, apart from R2 and 3PO, so they are, they are, they are very much separate. What kind of um, ideas of otherness do we get from, uh, from all the other expanded universe and films? So you end up with a weird thing when it comes to droids and and aliens in that there's a there's like a trope in sci-fi films and like and it's called Planet of the Hats, which is a super catchy catchy uh, title, and it basically means that when you encounter a representative of a species, they become the norm for every other member of that species that you will encounter. So you know, in a new hope. Han Solo bumps into Greedo, who, who's a Rhodian bounty hunter in a bar, and Han Solo just murders him. Um, and that's, you know, yeah. part of what makes Han Solo kind of like a cool guy, because he's like, ah, you're trying to kill me, blam, you're dead. But now, every Rhodian is a bounty hunter. All Rhodians are bounty hunter. It becomes a monoculture. And it's the same with huts. All huts are gangsters. All Wookiees are, you know, noble warriors. All Mon Calamari are piloting fishmen. Um, only humans are allowed to be different. Only humans have diversity of culture. Um, and that in itself is a representation of kind of how white American Hollywood approaches like black culture, African-American culture, Asian culture. You know, oh, it's a, it, they're all the same. You, it's, it's just a monoculture. It's only white Americans who can be different and kind of have diversity of experience and diversity of meaning and diversity of living. And you get that with droids and aliens in, in Star Wars. You know, all of the aliens become self-perpetuating. You know, you've met one Rhodian. You've, you, frankly, you've met them all. Um, with droids, you end up with a kind of a, a weird added element of, are you just slaves? You know, how, how alive are you? How sentient are you? What rights do you have? Um, and, you know, C-3PO and R2-D2 are designed to be the characters who that the audience live in. You know, we see the story through the eyes of R2-D2 and C-3PO. And at the end of Revenge of the Sith, um, uh, Bail Organa has taken ownership of R2-D2 and C-3PO, so that's basically, and I need you to wipe their memories for me. And George Lucas, in his script notes, basically, it's like, yeah, it's because he, he doesn't view them as being any more human than a trash can. Um, they're a possession, they're furniture, but they're also, you know, key characters and the droids and the aliens end up being these kind of placeholders for those who are not in the mainstream um and that, that you know that's explored in quite problematic ways in in some of the films and some of the novels and at times even in like the new jedi order that i mentioned earlier on there's, there's a touching element of like a droids rights movement that exists for a few of the books the idea that maybe you know, actually maybe they deserve de democratic representation as well and then it just gets killed off it just doesn't really get explored any further and i wonder if it's the type of thing that that lucasfilm now will explore in greater in greater depth because it's an opportunity to explore you know, wider rights and representations that is not just, you know, the 500,000 white guys who exist within the Star Wars universe. You know, it, 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 it became an ongoing joke because it's true that in Star Wars there is a woman and a black guy and everybody else is, is a white human. Um, because you don't see anybody else, even with the idea that, oh, you know, the Rebel Alliance is anti-imperial, that they've got all of these aliens that are supporting them because the, the, the Empire is superhuman centric. You do not see any aliens in the Rebel Alliance until Return of the Jedi. Everybody that you encounter before that is a white human man, um, except for Princess Leia and then Lando Calrissian. So the Rebel Alliance is not a diverse group either. Um, you know, partly that's the, the, the production issue. You know, it's expensive to make alien costumes. Humans are free. Um, there's loads of humans. We'll just cast some of them. But it becomes part of the wider, deeper law that there are issues with the representation of aliens. There are issues with the representations of droids. There are issues with the representations of women. There are issues with the representations of actors of colour. And you can either ignore them or you can address them. And addressing them is better. With the droids, though, they did, again, they started to bring it back in the solo movie with L3. Yeah. And then, and then they killed it off again. It's like, oh, <laughs> no. Because it was just such a brilliant, she was such a, a brilliant character that she was this whole sort of empowered, you know, we're all slow. Why are we slaves? Because the droids are basically slaves. Yeah. And like you said, they're treated as uh, as items. But then you get like that kind of Anakin and then Luke's fondness for R2. The three yeah. Someone did yeah. say the entire Star Wars series could just be 12 films of, 
uh, sorry, nine films of just everyone rat- ratting on 3PO. Yeah, he gets he gets turned off in several films. It's the equivalent of just knocking a human unconscious because they're being annoying. Um, yeah. And I mean, with the with the solo example, that you know, he's a droid's rights revolutionary, which is super interesting and would have been a great you know subplot to carry on. Also, though, voiced by a white British woman, which again, if you're going to go with a, a slaves' rights narrative, you know, it, why not tie into African American history and you know make it make it slightly more overt rather than quickly dodging out of the way of the of the critique at the last minute. Absolutely. And um, these are such um, important you know, issues to be discussing. Um, I was also thinking with the kind of end of your book and you're kind of speculating on where you know, Star Wars could go in the future. I mean, are there any particular characters from um, from the universe or now now kind of the legacy um, who who are, you know, more from underrepresented backgrounds who you'd quite like to see in a, in a future film? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, I would like to see, you know, more of Finn. I'd like to see more of Ray, and the like. Whether or not they'll they'll do that, I don't think John Boyega is keen for pretty good reasons. He was he was not treated particularly well, I think, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I think well, what's becoming interesting is the the extent to which the the drive to diversify Star Wars is is happening predominantly in pages of books and graphic novels. The cinematic aspect is still lagging somewhat behind um i mean there was a lesbian kiss in rise of skywalker and if you blinked you'd have missed it because it happened by two very very non-essential characters way off in the background um whereas you know the books and the graphic novels partly because you know they're marketing towards a slightly different audience are creating brand new characters to explore this this type of stuff with which is kind of cool because it allows you know a whole audience and a generation to kind of adopt those characters and you go to things like star wars celebration there's loads of people cosplaying as them and it's great um yeah, a recent book um uh introduced the fact that uh, obi-wan kenobi is bisexual um which some people found annoying i thought why would you find that annoying um i don't know what i don't know if obi-wan kenobi is right or left-handed you know as another part of his of his of his character i don't know if he's lactose intolerant um i don't know what shoe size he is all of these are parts of his character that we don't know about and haven't been brought up why would his sexuality be any different beyond that i think that i i I hope that lucasfilm and the creators will continue exploring this and i would like to see it moving from from pages to book from pages of books to to the screen um i understand on a kind of a, a logical level, why Lucasfilm are slightly reluctant to do that. I don't agree with it, and I think it's better to to do it than to to shy away from it. But I mean, the thing about about Star Wars is literally anybody who has appeared on the screen for like half a second has like a Wikipedia page. You know, the the sheer quantity of characters that you can draw from is endless. You know, as a weird offshoot of doing this book i got asked by by dk who have the 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 license from lucasfilm to help them co-write an official book called battles that change the galaxy and i created some characters in that um who you know i would definitely like to see those leap from the pages of the book into into a wider um into a wider film it's yeah the the characters and the potential are there it just requires the desire to do it and the desire to do it is caveated against a fear of a vocal but minority subset of the fandom, which I can understand is problematic when your your main overarching thing is to make money. But yeah, I don't I don't necessarily know the extent to which that should dictate your your response to to such fans. I mean, it kind of did because they they cut Rose out of yeah they did because and I think it was just from the and I can say it, the, the toxic nature of a small minority of fans. Yep. Um, and like John Boyega is like, we can't have a black stormtrooper. Why not? Why the hell not? Yeah. Why the hell not? <laughs> and they're they're wearing about the Empire's human centric and, and like, but their, their, their racial, human racial thing has never been explored in any of the um, expanded universe novels. Um, there is nothing in there to say that they are white supremacist in that sense. They are definitely a you know a supremacist fascistic organization in, in other ways, but yeah, there's there's we don't see under the helmets of any stormtroopers in in that aspect. And you know, I, I think I, I made a fairly flippant remark in the book that Rose Tico ends up being the only thing on screen 
or rather the, the lesbian kiss in Rise of Skywalker is the only thing that appears on screen for less time than most Tico does in yeah. in that film because she gets gutted out of it because of the toxic nature of the fan response to her, which is entirely misogynistic. It is entirely racist. This idea about, oh, you know, we don't hate the actress. We just we just hate the writing. We don't think people would have done this is is very Gamergate of desperately trying to dress these things up in coded language. So it's not this thing that we dislike. It's this other thing that we dislike. And they're just a representative of it. And, and I'm sorry, I've heard that song before. I know how I know how the tune goes. You you can't you can't kid me into believing that this is about writing rather than it is about um, Asian women. Um, yeah, I I I ain't buying. So I've known you for years, Chris, and I know how much of a lifelong Star Wars fan you are, as well as an amazing academic, both having proved yourself with the First World War and now now with this. How does it feel to have your baby? Your little book out in the whole world now. I'm choosing to believe that it was all those nice things you said about me just caught in your throat. It's, I just can't go through with it. It feels really... It feels great on a variety of... Like, firstly, this book took a real long time to, to write and, and do. I think I signed the contract for it in, like, 2016, while I was still finishing up, like, the, the one of my first World War books. Um, and then, you know, pandemics and delays and academic precarious and like really dragged this out so i ended up basically writing it in about six weeks in 2021 which just damn near broke me into teeny tiny 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 teeny tiny pieces um but what has been so nice about this is, is twofold firstly it is not the academic norm to release a book that people want to read you know ordinarily when an academic book of mine comes out I know the names, as in the first names of everybody who will read that, and we could probably travel together in the same car, if if need be. It's not it's not a big audience for something. Um, but you know, I've been fairly clear with Routledge. You know, this is a book about history, and it's a book about Star Wars. If we have this come out as a paperback at an affordable price, people will buy this because it's a book about history. It's a book about Star Wars, and if we put a nice front cover on it that explains it, it's a book about history, it's a book about Star Wars. People will buy it because. I'm a geek and I'd buy it. Um, and I know my audience. So the fact that, you know, people went, you know, suitably crazy about it, you know, in a very niche way was, was great. And it's been really cool. And, you know, I don't get asked to come and do a lot of stuff. Um, and I've been asked to do a lot of podcasts like this about the Star Wars book, which is, which is great. Cause, you know, why wouldn't I want to come and talk about this? But the overarching, the extra element that, has been nice for me is that DK Lucasfilm thing that I spoke about, this offshoot of being asked to come and contribute to um, actually writing Star Wars, which the, the the line that I use is that I've wanted to be an academic or I've been working towards being an academic for 15 years. And I've wanted to write Star Wars books since I was 15 years old. Um, and this predates my desire to do academia. And it's basically everything I've ever wanted to do. And the opportunity to do that once was amazing. The possibility of doing it more times is very, very appealing to me um, and something that I would very, very much be keen and like to do. What that means is I don't know if I can go back to writing about academic history of Star Wars because it's going to be a little bit transparently shameless of, you know, if I bring out, I don't know, more Death Stars, more democracy, and go, look at all of the extra history and politics stuff in these Star Wars books. Look at all the footnotes. And people go, yeah, those are your footnotes, Chris. Those are books and things that you wrote. This doesn't count. You absolute charlatan. You can't say, look how much new history is in it when you put it there. It's And and then on the other side of the street, I've got Lucasfilm going, what the hell do you think you're doing? Um, you can't resist the plan all along that you would write books for us and then you'd write books for us and you'd play both because... I can be pretty guaranteed that you're not going to get the chance to do this again. So then it becomes that, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to academically write about Star Wars or do I want to write Star Wars? And it's not a hard choice in that I want to do I want to do Star Wars stuff because it makes me happy in ways that academia doesn't make me as happy as it used to. Um, so I think that's probably like the main outcome of it is that like someone dangled the shiny shiny in front of me and god it's real shiny and i want it real bad um and i don't know entirely all the things i need to do to make that a, an ongoing thing but i want to do that 
So there's an element of I'm super pleased this book is out in the world simply for itself. And the fact that it appears to have landed and no, you know, I'm not getting angry Twitter messages, which was a real concern. We'll see how the audience greets this. Some of the things I've said in this podcast, please be nice to me. I'm I'm a nice person. I'm wearing a yellow jumper. Um, but, you know, I'm an academic. My job was to write my analysis of, of Star Wars' history and politics. And I think I and I think I did that. Um, and now I want to do the other things that make me happy. And I think I found the thing that makes me happy. I want to do that instead. Oh, although I do like the idea of you being a history Star Wars double agent. That sounds that sounds just as fun. Well, it sounds thank- amazing right up to the moment when that just implodes in on itself. <laughs> <laughs> All the court cases. Yeah, God. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, Chris. Can you remind everyone where they can uh, what, what what the titles of both your books are, so they can all rush out and buy them? So, I mean, I mean, by all means, if you want to buy like five or ten copies of each of these. I, you know, it'll help me a lot. So uh, book number one is, um, if we go, I'm going to do all of my books. I'm the guest. I'll do what I want. So if you're interested in First World War computer games, you could buy a book in, imaginatively titled The First World War in Computer Games um, from Palgrave. If you are a fan of uh, British, French and American relations during the First World War, you can buy a book imaginatively titled British, French and American relations during the First World War, 1914 to 1918. Or actually, it's on the Western Front. I've mangled the own title of my book. You'll find it. Um this book that we've been discussing is The History and Politics of Star Wars, Death Stars and Democracy. And I think I sent over maybe to Beth um, a 25% discount code that you can use on the Routledge website, which makes it you know, infinitely more affordable. It's not a super expensive paperback, but I know the books are expensive and cheaper books are, you know, more savings is more good. Um, so I imagine that's that'll probably be in like the show notes or something like that. If need be, I can read it out. Um, would that help or shall we, shall I just keep going? Um, we're probably going to try and get it into the history hack bookshop which is what we try and do with a lot of the books and then that way i'm going to do the plug to the bookshop now you uh you get a larger slice of the money history hack gets a slice of the money and um book publishers who have a lot of money anyway that yeah. can use them for uh, rocket fuel to build or build their own death stars mr bezos do yeah. that yeah you know again buy five or ten copies you know i might be able to afford from the royalties to, to heat my house for a day um over over the winter and then the other the other the actual official star wars book which i cover with several other people is called star wars battles that change the galaxy which is just a wonderful joyous thing i don't get any royalties or anything like that that's never the deal with things but if you like star wars and you like it's it's a military history of the star wars universe through battles it's it's, it's a very cool beautiful thing that makes me very happy our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.